Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 3, please. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs and chapter 3. For the last several weeks, we've been on the series called The Wisdom of God. Everyone say the wisdom of God. Come on, everyone say the wisdom of God. All right, I pray that this is being helpful to you and, and that you're expecting to walk in the wisdom of God on a daily basis, not just when you're at church, not just when you're praying, but that you're expecting to walk in the wisdom of God in every single area of your life. Amen. And so we already covered a lot of different, uh, uh, a lot of ground, a lot of different uh, um, things regarding the wisdom of God and how we are supposed to love it, get it exalted in our life. And when we do that, there is going to be on the other side of exalting wisdom or loving wisdom or getting wisdom is increase, is elevation, is promotion. So many things that are going to um, uh, come into our lives or the, uh, there's a lot of things that we're going to experience in our lives simply by making sure that wisdom is part of our lives. Amen. Now, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, happy is the man. Everyone say happy. All right, happy is the man or happy is the woman who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her pro proceeds are better than profits of silver and her gain fi than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. A length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. Amen. Now, last week, how many of you were here last week? All right. Okay. That's the majority of you. Now, if you were not here last week or if you have not caught up with the message online, I would really encourage you to make sure that you catch up with last week. Because last week, if you listen to that message and if you get that into your heart, if you meditate on it, it should bring about a, 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 a tremendous shift in the way you think about you living by the wisdom of God. In the way you think about the wisdom of God flowing through your life or the wisdom of God operating in your life. That brings about a major shift. And now, today what I want us to do is I want us to really focus on this um, verse, on verse 16. It says, length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Everyone say riches and honor. Riches and honor. Everyone say riches and honor. So today what I want to do is, for the time that we have as much as possible, I want to focus on riches this morning. Okay, I want to focus on riches because um, the reality is throughout the book of Proverbs, throughout the life of Solomon and throughout the life of anybody that walked in godly wisdom, you cannot separate with the wisdom of God from the riches of God. You cannot separate the wisdom of God from the supply of God. You cannot separate the wisdom of God from the prosperity of God. Now, I understand that words like rich, words like prosperity, words like abundance, sometimes they don't sit well with a Christian. Okay? They don't, they, sometimes people can get very uncomfortable even hearing those kinds of words coming out of a pastor's mouth. Or even when, whenever somebody or a pastor starts talking about money, there is a little bit of discomfort in, 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 in the hearts of uh, Christians because they don't know what he's going to say. Is he after my money? Is he going to take up another offering after he pre uh, finishes preaching? Why is he talking about money? Is there some other project that he's trying to raise money for? All of these questions begin to pop up. Okay, now let me uh, uh, make this clear. I'm not raising a special offering or anything this morning. All right. I'm not saying this to get money from you. Please understand for me, I'm not talking for every pastor, but for me, every single time I talk about money or finances, it is so that I can get some of God's money to you to you, not to get money from you, but I always preach with the intent of getting some money to you so that you prosper in every area of your life. And that prosperity also includes the area of finances. Amen? Now, how many of you want to be happy in life? All right. How many of you want to have a long life? All right. How many of you want to have riches and honor in life? All right. So if you answered yes to those three things, in these couple of verses that we just read, wisdom is connected to all three of them. He says, you want a happy life? He says, wisdom is the answer. He says, you want a long life? He says, wisdom is the answer. He says, you want riches and honor in your life? He says, wisdom is the answer. 
So a lot of times we, we, we pray for long life. We pray for happiness in our life. God, I just want to be happy. Please take away these problems in my life. Please take away, you know, these, uh, the, these issues in my life. And we pray for those kinds of things. And we pray for riches. We might not use the word riches, but we pray for increase. We pray for a uh, bonus. We pray for uh, better jobs or we pray for, uh, um, uh, you know, a better financial year when it comes to our businesses and so on and so forth. So these three things are something that we pray for. And yet these verses simply uh, indicate to us that if you get the wisdom of God operating in your life, then all three, of these, all three of these areas of your life will simply be a part of your life. Amen? Now, let's go to the new covenant, and I want us to go to the new covenant, establish certain things, and then come back to the old covenant, and, and, and we'll, we'll do that uh, uh, for this morning, all right? So, for a very long time, uh, Christians have had the mindset that wealth or riches are something that need to be avoided in our lives. Okay? That is sometimes because of religious teaching, sometimes because of tradition, and sometimes even because of culture. All right? So there have been certain misconceptions. It's not the truth of the Word of God that has caused a person to think that way. It has always been misconceptions that have led Christians to have a wrong relationship with riches. Now, I can talk a lot about riches, but if those misconceptions or if the foundation is not uh, um, uh, laid properly... No matter what I talk about, it will always be on a faulty foundation. So I want to deal with some of the misconceptions. Um, and I, I, you know, as I was preparing, I, could, I, I was coming up with one after the other after the other. So I just decided for today, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to deal with two commonly talked about misconceptions. And then we're going to get into the Word and see what the Word has to say to us this morning. Amen? All right, number one, misconception number one that needs to be thought about and we need to renew our minds with the truth and rather than living by a misconception. Number one, the misconception is that the money is root of all evil. The misconception is that the money is the root of all evil. Now, why did this mis misconception even start? Why did we begin to think this way? Well, it comes from this uh, Bible verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and let's read verses 9 and 10, please. All right, it says, But those who crave, everyone say crave, Right? He says, but those who crave to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, useless, godless, and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction and miserable perishing. Next verse. He says, for the love of money. Everyone say love. Come on, everyone say love. love. Now, he did not say for, lo for, for money is a root of all evil, but he says for the Love of money is a root of all evils. It is through this, where am I? All, oh yeah. It is through this craving that some have been led astray and have made wander, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through the uh, through with many acute uh, mental pangs. Now, what he's saying is that money is not the issue. Riches are not the issue. It is this craving for riches. It is the craving for money. That craving, that love. See, we were never supposed to love things. We were always created to love God and love people. We were never created to love things. See, and this will just help you even in your daily uh, uh, thought life and in your uh, speaking. Do, when you like your shoes or, or watch or car, don't say, I love my car. And then look at your wife and say, I love my wife too. You understand? The car and the wife are not the same thing. One is a thing. It's an object. Another is a person. Don't love things. You can say, I enjoy my car. I really like my car. But don't say, I love my car. Does that make sense? Okay, because you were never meant to love things. See, because when people begin to love things, they, they you know, they, they, I mean, their life is encapsulated in that thing. Sometimes you will see uh, uh, on the streets, some small scratch on their car and the guy loses his mind. 
I mean, he's ready to kill the other person on the street. Why? Because there is a small scratch on his car, on his bike or something valuable, their cell phone falls to the ground because somebody you know, uh, uh, mistakenly hit their hand or something and there's a crack on the screen or something and they, it's like their life crumbles right in front of their eyes. Why? Because their entire identity is wrapped up around that thing. See, that is the love of a thing. And God never told us to love things. We're supposed to love him and love people. That's what we were created for. Now here in Timothy, he's not saying riches or money is the root of all evil. He's saying, but this craving, that love. See, that love for riches, the love for that money, that love for the car will cause you to injure another person on the street. Why? Because that love for that car overrides the love for another human being. Are you understanding that? Okay, and so here he says, the love of money, that is the root for the evils that we see in life, and we see in culture, we see in society, we see in the world. So number one misconception is that money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. All right, let's take a look at another misconception. Misconception number two. And this misconception is that Jesus was poor, and we also need to be poor. The misconception is that Jesus was poor and therefore we also need to be poor. Why? Because he's the master, we're the followers. He, he's the leader, we're the disciples and therefore we not to live like the master. And so Jesus was a poor man and therefore we ought to be a poor people. And here is one of the religious misconceptions. And even when you think about, especially in the Catholic faith, he, the, the, the priests take a vow of poverty. A vow of poverty. Now, Jesus never took a vow of poverty. The apostles never took a vow of poverty. However, tradition added the vow of poverty. And now because of tradition, we've had this mental idea that, okay, we need to stay away from riches. We need to stay away from wealth. And we need to be like our master, be like our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we, number one, we think he was poor and therefore we ought to be poor. Now, a lot of Christians will say that but a lot of Christians don't really live that out. Because even the Christians that say that, again, secretly, they're praying for better jobs. Now, why are you praying for better jobs? It's only so that you can have more money than you already have. Are you understanding that? And so we have to understand, number one, Jesus was not poor. I don't have time to get into that this morning, but Jesus was not poor. Now, just for the sake of it, I actually went online and looked at the definition for the word poor. Okay, here's the definition for the word poor. Poor means lacking sufficient money to live at a standard considered comfortable or normal in a society. Now you tell me, when did Jesus li live in a way that was below what was normal in his time or during his time? Did Jesus ever go hungry? Did Jesus, was Jesus ever homeless? No. Jesus, did Jesus ever lack transportation? No. There was nothing that Jesus lacked. Every single time he needed something, provision was there. Which means what? That means he was always supplied. Which means what? That means he was not poor. And if he was always supplied, what does that mean? That means he was a rich man. A rich man is not, a, a, a rich man is simply a man that is supplied. That means all his desires, or everything that needs to happen in his life is being taken care of. That's a rich man. That's a rich man. That's a rich woman. And so the misconception is that we think Jesus lived a poor life. Now, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. See, Jesus was poor, but he was only poor once. In one specific moment, and I'm going to show that to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. And it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. That you through his poverty might become rich. Now, I want you to look at this verse. In four, I, I broke it down into four different areas. Okay, let's take a look at the first part. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just stop, stop there. Now, whenever you think about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, what do you think? It is free and it is a gift. 
The grace of God is not something we earn. It is something that is free and it is a gift. So he already is saying, Paul is writing and he's saying, hey, you guys already know the grace of our Lord. Why? Because I've been teaching about the grace all my life. He says, you know the gospel, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the same grace where the, the, the sinless, spotless lamb became sin for us, you know that grace. You know the grace that saved us from our sins, you know that grace. You know the grace that uh, forgave all of our sins, you know that grace. He says, so you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, second part, that though he was rich... Though he was rich. So one thing has to be established. That means at some point Jesus was rich. Jesus was rich. Jesus was rich way beyond our comprehension. He was rich in every facet of life. So he says, though he was rich, yet for your sake. Everyone say, my sake. So he was rich, yet for our sake he became what? He became poor. Now, when people say he became poor, people think, well, in heaven he had gold, he had everything, he had angels, he had uh, everything uh, was ready for him. But when he came to earth, he was born in a manger and he didn't have anything. And therefore, that is when he became poor. Wrong. Wrong. No, he was born in a manger not because they were poor. He was born in a manger because there were no hotel rooms available. See, many people don't even think about that. He was not born in a manger because of choice. It's not like Mary and Joseph said, we don't have any money, so I guess the only thing that we can do is find a manger. No, that's not the case. They looked for places, they could not find any place, and therefore, they found themselves in the manger. So it's not like they did not have any money. They had. See, you can have all the money in the world, but when you go to a new place, and if there are three hotels there, and all three of them are already booked, what do you do? You just spend the night in your car or something else. But you're not going to get into a room that is already booked. Are you understanding that? So number one, he was not born in a manger because Mary and Joseph were poor. It was because every other hotel room was already occupied. Number two, the Bible also says once he was born, the three wise men start looking for him. By the time the three wise men show up, what do they bring him? They bring him gifts. They, bring, they don't bring him cheap gifts. They bring him very expensive gifts. So, again, from that time, just by the fact that he received those gifts after being born, he's already a well-supplied young boy who does not lack anything. Are you understanding that? So he was not poor while he lived on the earth. Now. The next thing he says, yet for your sakes, he became poor. Now the question is, then when did he become poor? Now that's a good question to ask. He became poor that you through his poverty might become what? Come on, might become, might become, might become rich. So a couple of things need to be established. That means because Jesus was rich, and he became poor, the whole point of him becoming poor is not so that you also become poor. See, even if you think Jesus lived a poor life, you have to understand he lived a poor life so that you don't have to live a poor life. At least that you have to agree for. Why? Because he says, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become, might become rich. Now, again, let me clarify. This is not talking about becoming spiritually rich. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the entire verse is, sorry, the entire chapter is talking about money. The entire chapter is talking about material goods. It's not talking about spiritual stuff. It's talking about materials and this, earth, uh, this world that we live in. So here he says, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, what does this sound like? Where else do we see this kind of exchange taking place? 
Second Corinthians chapter five. That even though, even though he had no sin, yet he became sin. Why? Not so that we also can be sinners. No, he became sin so that we can become what? The righteousness of God. See, Jesus was never sick. But yet, on the cross, what did he become? He became sickness. Every sickness was upon his body. Why? So that you can be healed. On the cross, he was condemned. Why? So that you can be forgiven. Are you understanding that? So everything that happened as a result, of, see, everything that you see happening in our lives as a result of the curse, that happened in the life of Jesus, but it only happened all at once when he was hanging on the cross. When he was hanging on the cross. Why? Because that was, the, see, poverty, lack is a result of the curse, not a result of the blessing. Never do you see God say, and oh, my children Israel, I am going to bless you with three years of lack. You don't see that. You never see a father saying, oh, my son, I bless you that you will never find a job for the next three years. No, that's not a blessing. You know that it is part of the curse, not part of the blessing. So when this Jesus came into this world so that he can absorb the curse, so when did he do that? On the cross not during his earthly living of 33 years. He did not, Jesus was not a poor man for 33 years. Jesus was a rich man for 33 years, but for those few hours on that cross, that's when he became poor. So that you, through that sacrifice, might be made rich. Might be made rich, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you've got to understand that and establish that according to the new covenant. Now, once that is established, now let's go back to the book of Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 8, please. And let's look at verse 17. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. Again, see, we see it in, in another chapter. Here, wisdom is talking and wisdom is saying, if, you, if they love me and seek me diligently, they'll find me. And once they find wisdom, what else are they going to find? Riches and honor are with me, wisdom is saying. They're already with me. So when you find wisdom, you find riches and honor. Then he says, enduring riches and righteousness. Now think about that. See, that means enduring riches and righteousness can go together. Just because you are a rich man does not mean somehow you became unholy. Just because you're a rich man does not mean that you somehow became ungodly. See, here it says enduring riches and righteousness. That means you can be a rich person and have a right standing with God. Hallelujah. That means you can be a rich woman and still have a right standing with God. Never being ashamed of the fact that you are a rich woman. In fact, you should be happy that you're a rich woman. Why? Because every single time somebody comes across your life, that's another opportunity for you to glorify God and let them know that you are rich, not by your own strength, but because of God Almighty. But because of God Almighty. Amen? Look at what the next verse says. My, my, my fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, and my revenue uh, than choice silver. I traverse the way of the righteous of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice, that I may cause those who love me to inherit wealth, that I may fill their treasures. Hallelujah. See, he's saying that I might cause them. That means once you have wisdom, wisdom will cause you to inherit wealth. And wisdom will cause you to make sure that your treasuries are filled. That means your bank accounts are filled. That means your investments are filled. What's causing that? Wisdom. Wisdom is causing that. Now, if you, if you put all of this together with last week's message, then you understand the importance of flowing in the wisdom of God in every decision that you make. Why? Because every single time you make a decision that is based on godly wisdom, it will always produce riches and honor in life. You will never make a godly decision that will dishonor you in this world. 
every godly decision that you make will always lead you to riches and honor. In the book of Isaiah, he says, I will teach you how to profit. Profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. Why is God interested in teaching us profit? Because he's not interested in seeing you walk through loss. It's as simple as that. I will teach you how to profit, he says. Amen? So go with me to Proverbs chapter 13, please. Why is this so important? And why, do you, why am I teaching on this? Look at what Proverbs 13 and verse 22 says. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man, a good woman. This is what a good man and a good woman does, according to the Bible. A good man, a good woman, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. How many of you want to be considered as a good man or a good woman? All right, here's your assignment. Here's your assignment. Your assignment from God is not just to pray throughout your life and die. Prayer is very important. Do that for the rest of your life. But then included in that assignment for your life is that you leave an inheritance for your children's children. That means, your, that means you have to have enough to leave an inheritance for your grandchildren. For your grandchildren. Hallelujah. So according to God, it's not even your parents that should be taking care of you. It's your grandparents that should be taking care of you. And your parents are setting things aside for your children. And you start setting things aside for your grandchildren. That's the way of God. So he says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Uh, man, that, that, that's, there is so much in that verse. The wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The wealth of the sinner. Do you understand? See, if God is opposed to you having money, okay? If God is opposed to Christians being wealthy, then why is the wealth of the sinner being stored up for the righteous? Because if money and wealth is so bad, then that wealth, once it comes to the hands of the righteous, they'll become unrighteous. But that's not the case. Are you understanding that? So, so why is an evil man's wealth being stored up? Why is God storing that up? So that that wealth can find its way to you. Are you understanding that? Let's look at that in another translation, in the New Living. It says, good people, how many good people in this place? Amen. Good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren. Good people do that. Godly people do that. They don't look at that and say, oh, this is worldly stuff. No, 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 no. Godly people understand something. Even though we're not of this world, we still live in this world. Hallelujah. And so he says, good people leave an inheritance for their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth Passes to the godly. How many godly people do I have in this place? Do you know what this, this verse just said? There is money that is looking to come into your lives. That means there is... See, here's how you need to think about it. There is some sinner in this world that is working tirelessly day and night. Tirelessly day and night. And he's working for me. You need to say he's working for me too, Pastor. Why? He says the wealth of the sinner, the sinner's wealth passes. See, he's working tirelessly day and night so that he can store it up. But as he's storing it, the wealth is looking to be transferred into a godly person's hands. So you walk in the wisdom of God. See, that's why when, when the Bible talks about wisdom, he says, don't be like the foolish person who keeps chopping at the tree with a blunt axe. He says, take time to sharpen it. He says, that's wisdom. 
So the world works tirelessly night and day, night and day, night and day, losing their family, losing their health, losing all that they have. And they're working night and day, night and day, night and day. Here is the godly man. Here is the godly woman. They walk in the wisdom of God. They walk in the wisdom of God. And as they walk in the wisdom of God, all of a sudden, all that money is attracted to you. And that money passes its way, finds its way into your lives. See, that's the wisdom of God. See, this is where the supernatural kicks in. See, this is where riches in the life of a Christian are not limited to their intellect or education. You will not see one example in the Bible where a wealthy man came into wealth because of intellect or education. And yet somehow Christians, we have convinced ourselves the only way we can become rich is by intellect and education. And you see in the old covenant and in the new covenant, it was never... See, I'm not saying don't use intellect. I'm not saying don't get educated. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying don't limit your prosperity or don't limit your riches or wealth simply based on your intellect or education. Here he says, again, good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren, but the sinner's wealth passes to the godly. It passes to the godly. See, when I, when I think about this, I, I, I think about my father. He's not here uh, uh, with us in person today. But see, and I think I can say this w without being dishonorable to him because this is part of his testimony. Majority of the people that he has come across in his life are far more educated than he is. In fact, I would probably say 90% of the people or more that are in this service right now, you would be way more educated than my father is. My father has a very, had a very basic education. A very basic education. Came from a very poor family. Very poor education, very poor family, very poor uh, uh, background in many ways. And yet, because of the wisdom of God and because of the favor of God, he can, according to this verse, is considered to be a very good man. A very good man. Now, I'm not just talking about character and all of those things. I'm talking about the fact that, that a, a, a man that, according to world standards, is not where he was supposed to be. And yet, because of the wisdom of God and walking in the fear of the Lord, the, the supernatural wisdom of God provided for him in such a way that he's able to leave an inheritance for his children's children. Are you understanding that? I, you know, I, I think about the time when many of you know that uh, for a few years I was in the United States uh, uh, going to college. And when we went to college, even when b just when me and my brother were supposed to move, my father had a green card since like I think the 70s, uh, 1970s, but he never thought that he will take his family to the U.S. So he never applied for anything. In fact, the very first time he would try to get us a tourist visa, it was being rejected every single time because they thought, okay, he, they, these guys will go there, they'll become illegals, and you know, they, they thought my father was trying to keep us in America or something like that, and so they never gave us the visa for many, many years. But throughout all of those things, finally, when we got the visa for, for education purposes, we went there, and there was, he, he never built up credit, he never built up the financial system, he never worked it out in the U.S. because he never thought his kids will go to the U.S. But when all of that happened, because of the wisdom of God, because of the favor of God, things began to happen in our lives once we went there, that even people who were born and raised in the U.S. for their entire life were shocked at the things that my parents were experiencing in the U.S. I'm talking about not spiritually being shocked. I'm talking about they would come to our house and they could not believe the house that we were living in. They would ask us like, this is your house? Yeah, it is. You guys bought this house? Yes, we did. And they could not even believe that somebody that's a missionary would be able to purchase a house like that. See, this is where... When the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just and that the favor of God and when you walk in the wisdom of God that, that wealth and riches come, come together, this is where you see the hand of God. 
See, even when we went there, we were living in a very small uh, uh, apartment, and then through one of the members of the, the church that we were going to, they started talking and say, I, you can actually um, uh, go ahead and purchase the house, the money that you're using for rent, you can actually put it for mortgage and blah, blah, blah. And long story short, we were able to, without proper credit for my father, okay, or my mother in the U.S., they were able to purchase when they went to a development, there were all these uh, villas or houses that were being built in a huge development. And nobody knew for whatever reason, the biggest lot in the entire development, nobody bought it. And by that time, 90% of all the plots were already sold. My father, he always likes a large property. And so he walks there, we went into the office, and he's looking at the site map, and they're selecting different things, and he says, this is sold, this is sold, this is sold. And finally, he looks at one piece, points it at and says, what about this one in the corner? And he said, they look at it and say, oh, it looks like it's still open. And long story short, they find out that it is the largest piece of property in the entire development. Four acres. Four acres. Now, every other house is not even one acre in the entire development. Four acres of property. Nobody knows why nobody selected it. And it was not even expensive. It was dirt cheap. It was cheap. And so my parents were able to buy it. And normally in the US, if you know, uh, they, usually people take a mortgage of 15 years or 30 years. My parents took a 30-year mortgage, but again, by the wisdom of God, my parents were able to pay a 30-year mortgage in about four years. In about four years. Again, why? It's not based on their intellect. It was not based on their education. It was simply based on walking by the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. See, the wisdom of God will take you to places that you cannot think of on your own. Are you understanding that? See, go with me to uh, Second Chronicles. I want you to take a look at uh, uh, Solomon's riches here. The book of Second Chronicles, chapter 8. Second Chronicles, chapter 8, and verse 16 says, Now all the work of Solomon was well ordered from the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord until it was finished. So the house of the Lord was completed. Everyone say completed. Then Solomon went to Ezion, Geber, and Elath on the seacoast of the land of Edom. And Hiram sent him ships by the hand of the servants and the servants um, who knew the sea. They went with the servants of Solomon to Ophir and acquired 450 talents of gold from there and brought it to, the king, to king Solomon. Now, see, number one, when you talk about 450, what is this, talents? That's equivalent to roughly somewhere between 400 to 500 million dollars worth. Okay? And this was not a one time thing. This was something that consistently happened for Solomon. Now, when did this happen? He says it happened after the house of the Lord was completed. Now, that's a key. It happened after the house of the Lord was completed. See, even when I think about my, my, my parents' house in the U.S., see, once they purchased the house, while we were in just a couple of months into it, uh, the church that we were attending to got into an expansion project. That means they were renovating their entire church building. They were going to expand it and increase the capacity of the building and all of that. And so it was, at that point, I think like almost, um, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around $14 million budget, okay, uh, for the expansion of the church and all of that. And during that time, when, we, when my parents were actually trying to get rid of this house debt, during that time, my parents decided that they were going to be one of the largest givers for that project. That they, that's how they decided. And so they, the, the church was doing a particular campaign where they were saying each person can uh, decide to give X amount of thousands of dollars. And so what my father did was... Yeah, uh, my father and mother signed up. Then me and my, they signed up my name. They signed up my brother's name. And my grandmother was living uh, with us as well. And so they signed up my grandmother's name. And so it was like all five of us, most of the time in the church, the entire family gave it as one. My father decided, no, we're not just going to give it as one family. We're going to give it as one individual in our case. And so it was like five families giving to the work of God. And so they did that. And while they were giving to the house of God for the completion of the work, they came across wisdom. 
This is where my mother came across certain information where she began to understand how the banking system functions and the loan system functions in America. And then because of that wisdom, she was able to do certain things which completely reduced the debt of the house. And what would have normally taken an American family 30 years to pay, we were able to pay in how many years? About four years. Hallelujah. So not so busy and focused in acquiring a new house and then hard work and pay it off, pay it off, pay it off. I'm not, you, there's nothing wrong with having that attitude. But while you're doing that, open to the wisdom of God. Open to the wisdom of God. See, Solomon was not after the gold. Solomon's focus was complete the mission, complete the house of God. The house of God is completed and now as a result of that, what's happening? The wealth is coming in. He's not asking for the wealth, but the wealth is coming in. Are you understanding that? So roughly, this is about 400 to 500 uh, 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 million dollars. Now, go with me to the next chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Let me read these verses quickly. Uh, starting from verse 13. It says, the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. So earlier, we saw that it was 450. Now it says 666 talents of gold, besides uh, what the traveling merchants and traders brought. And all the kings of Arabia, governors of the country, brought gold and silver to Solomon. And King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of hammered gold went into each shield. He also made 300 shields of hammered gold. 300 shekels of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Verse 17. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps with a footstool of gold, which were fastened to the throne. There were armrests on each side of the uh, place of the seat. And two lions stood beside the armrest. Twelve lions stood there, one on each side of the six steps. Now, he says, nothing like this had been made for any other kingdom. See, all the other details, it doesn't matter really to us because we don't use shields, we don't use thrones today. But the point is that part. Nothing like this had been made for any other kingdom any other kingdom. That's the point I want you to get. Then he goes on to say, verse 20, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Look at this part. Not one was silver. Not one was silver. Why? Did he not like silver? No. Look at the reason. Not one was silver, for this was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon. You understand what he's saying? That means during the days of Solomon, they would look at silver and think, nah, throw this away. Who wants silver? Who cares about silver? Why? Because there was so much coming in. There was so much coming in. Now, I'm not talking about becoming reckless, but I'm trying to just get this into your minds that there is so much that can come into your life simply by the wisdom of God. Not by you pursuing after money. Not by you craving after money. Not by you loving money and running after money. But so much can come in simply by having wisdom, walking in wisdom, submitting to wisdom, living according to wisdom. See, every one of us knows a time in our lives where um, if you think about your childhood, you would go to certain uh, small stores and one rupee coin also had a certain value because even with one rupee, you can get certain things. Now today, how many of you will, 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 will fight with somebody for one rupee? You really won't. Some of you are in a place where if a five rupee coin falls into a very dirty place, you might not even really consider picking it back up, right? For some of you, even a 10 rupee note, if you had it in your pocket and by the time you went home and like you feel like it's missing, you don't lose your day over a 10 rupee note. For some of you, even if you lose 100 rupees, you're not going to lose sleep over it. For some of you, 
You might lose 1,000 rupees and you will not lose sleep over it. For some of you, you might lose 10,000 rupees and you will not lose sleep over it. There are those of you who will lose 1 lakh rupees and will not lose sleep over it. There are those in this world who will lose 10 lakh rupees and will not lose sleep over it. There are those who will lose 1 crore rupees and will not sleep o- lose a night's sleep over it. 10 crores, 100 crores, the list just goes on. That means what? That simply means money and wealth is already in this world. It's simply in the wrong hands. It's simply in the wrong hands. And for the most part, Christians, we have only been trained to ask God and beg God for a job, for a raise, and a better job and more raise. Are you understanding that? So what are we doing? We're not pursuing wisdom. We're not expecting to walk in the wisdom of Jesus. What are we doing every single time? Oh, I have some wisdom, God. Here is my wisdom. I got it from school. This wisdom, I got it from my parents. This wisdom, I got it from my teachers. You know what they told me? They told me I need a very good job, Jesus. So here is my prayer request. Give me a very good job. Jesus, I have some more wisdom now. You know what they told me? Once I get a job, that now I have to believe for a raise. So Jesus, here is my request. I want a raise. Jesus, I got some more wisdom. I read an article. And they said that if I move to this city, or if I move to this country, that's even better. So, Jesus, give me the visa. Okay, got the visa. Now we move. Jesus, I got some more wisdom. I need a raise even in this new country. So we ask for the raise in the new country. Now, I'm not trying to mock anybody. I'm, I'm trying to get a point across. What are we doing throughout this time? We are pursuing something that we don't ever need to be pursuing. I hope I'm getting my point across. We're pursuing after things we don't need to be pursuing after. But if you pursue wisdom, submit to wisdom, honor wisdom, Exalt wisdom. That means even if there is some other worldly wisdom, don't say, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Here's godly wisdom. And so even if I have not been taught godly wisdom in school, in college, by my lecturer, by my boss at work, by my banker, by my investor, here's what I've learned. If I follow the wisdom of God, then all these things that the world pursues, they come after me. They come after me. See, the banker, the the, the financial advisor would have advised my parents not to give to the church. Why? No, you're in a mortgage right now. So your job is to take care of the mortgage. But no, there's higher wisdom. There's godly wisdom. And godly wisdom says, hey, there's an opportunity for you to sow into the kingdom of God like never before. I know you're coming from a third world nation like India, and now you've moved to the US and you don't have a credit score that is proper, you don't have an education, and you don't have a job that is settled, but remember, it is the Lord, the God, who provided the house to begin with. And so now when he opens the door to sow into the kingdom, you exalt what? Wisdom. Godly wisdom. And when you exalt godly wisdom, something is coming. Something is coming. Something is coming. And that's always going to bring riches and honor. Riches and honor. Riches and honor. Riches and honor. Why? Because wisdom is exalted. Wisdom is pursued. And so here he says all of this was coming into the life of Solomon, not because he asked for it. That's the key. He didn't ask for it. Even though he was not asking for it, it was simply coming. 
It was simply coming. Look at what, what, what the next verse says. Verse 21. For the king's ships went to um, Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years, the merchant ships came, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and monkeys. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings. Everyone say all the kings. All the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. So not only was he the wisest king, he was the richest king. See, wisdom and wealth, again, going hand in hand. He was the wisest king and he was the richest king. Verse 23 says, And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear the wisdom which God had put in his heart. See, this wisdom did not come by him simply reading books. Even though I'm sure he read a lot of books. Even though I'm sure he had teachers and he submitted to teachers as he was growing up. But this wisdom with which he was operating under came from God. It came from God. Hallelujah. Next couple of verses. Very quickly. Verse 24. Each man brought his present. See, every time they came to king, the king uh, uh, Solomon, they came with a gift. They came with a gift. They came with a gift. That's why Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, he says, uh, or, or in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, your gift will make room for you. And a lot of people think it's their talent. Uh-uh. When the Bible is saying your gift will make room for you, he's talking about the physical gift that you bring to honor those in authority. He says that gift, it will make room for you. So everybody that would come to Solomon would come with a gift. And then he says, each man brought uh, his present, articles of silver and gold, garments, armor, spices, horses, and mules at the set rate year by year. Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses and chariots, 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. So he reigned over the kings uh, from the river of the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. Verse 27, the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. He made silver as common as what? Stones. See, there was so much coming in. Silver was just common. It was like, that's trash, man. We don't use silver for anything here. You walk into his kingdom, it's like silver, no value. Why? Because there is too much of it. It's way too much of it. So he says, he, 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 there was no value for it. And he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores which are in the lowland. And they brought horses to Solomon from Egypt and from all lands. See, as a result of Wisdom, everyone say wisdom. wisdom. Wealth and riches and honor were attached to Solomon. Amen. Amen. Now, last week I told you about the fact that Christ has been made unto you wisdom. And wisdom, the tree of life, Jesus is the vine, you are the branch. See, because Jesus walked in the wisdom of God. Abundant supply was always attached to him. Whenever he needed a boat, the boat was there. Whenever the boat was not there, he would walk on water. Whenever he needed transportation, he said, what did he tell his disciples? Go and you will find an ass, you'll find a donkey. Tell him that the master needs of it and bring it, he said. Now, that's an example of the wealth of the wicked laid up for the righteous. Jesus did not buy the donkey. He didn't buy the donkey from the man. He simply said, I have use of it. And what did that man do? Okay, use it. Now, that man bought the donkey. He worked hard to buy the donkey. And yet, who was using it? Jesus was. Jesus was using it. Jesus was using it. When he needed to pay taxes, the money was there. See, in, in according to our mind, the money should be in the bank account or in his purse or in his wallet. See, that's the only difference. See, the people of the world would care, whatever would 
be carried in their wallet or in their pocket, Jesus simply was not carrying it. But whenever it was needed, he would simply say, go get it. Go get it. See, for example, if I need to pay somebody some money right now after the service, I don't, I don't have any money on me right now. I don't know if there is any money in my bag. I literally, like, I don't, I don't even think I have one rupee in my pocket right now, okay? But if somebody comes and says, well, we need to pay 10,000 rupees to somebody, I'm not getting into sweat and tension and worry. I'll simply ask one of the guys who knows my house, hey, listen, I'll be talking to the people there, go home quickly, and they'll be so-and-so, ask them to give you 10,000 rupees and quickly bring it to me. And one of the boys will go and do that for me. So why? See, just because I don't have it on me does not mean I don't possess it. Are you understanding that? So Jesus did not have the, the money to pay taxes on him. But Peter comes and says, we need to pay taxes. So what does Jesus do? He says, okay, go get it. Where Jesus? Whose house? No, not to the house. Go to the lake. Is your friend at the lake? No, there's a fish in the lake. What am I supposed to do with it? Fish for it. Catch it. Open its mouth. You'll find the money. Go pay the taxes. See, it was as simple as you telling your friend, here is my card. Go to the ATM and bring some money. Jesus says, go to the lake. Fish is there. Get the money. Simple as that, which means what? Just because you don't have money in your pocket right now, you're not worried. Why? Because you have money somewhere else. And that's why you're not worried. You simply give your card to your friend and say, hey, I'm busy right now. Please do this for me. Go get the money. Jesus was doing the same thing. He said, go to the fish. It'll give you the money, pay the taxes. That's a man that is abundantly supplied. You never see Jesus saying, if only I had little more money, I would do bigger meetings. If I had little, another two donkeys, then all of us could go to that other city and do another crusade there. Never. You never see that. Why? Because it was always abundantly supplied. Okay, we're almost done. Go with me to uh, Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21 and verse 20. Uh, let's go to the New Living Translation. It says, the wise have wealth and luxury but fools spend whatever they get. Now let me make it very practical before we close. Okay? Now all of this wisdom that's in you because of Christ Jesus, the question is what are you doing with it? See, if you have wisdom, <laughs> please get this, if you have wisdom, you have riches. How many of you have wisdom? See, some of you are Again, don't think through this brain. You have the mind of Christ. The wisdom of God is within you. Jesus has been made unto you the wisdom of God. And so therefore, even if you are uneducated, you, are, you have the wisdom of God. If you are a Christian, you have the wisdom of God. Now, every time the wisdom of God is present, what else is present? Come on, what else is present? Come on, what else is present? What else is present? Riches. So if riches and honor are present with wisdom. See, some people have a hard time saying, it is God's will for me to be rich. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it is God's will for you to be wise? See, more people will be happy to say yes to that. But if I say it's God's will for you to be rich, mm, I don't know, Pastor. Statement is little doubtful. Why? Because of misconceptions. See, but if I say, do you believe that it is God's will for you to be wise? We say, yes, yes, yes. Well, if you're going to be wise, then guess what? Something else is coming along with that wisdom. It's riches. Now, if you say you have the wisdom of God, that means you're also saying you have riches. Now, whether or not you see it in the physical manifestation yet, the reality is in the realm of the spirit, you have riches. The question is whether you're living according to that wisdom. Here he says, the wise have wealth and luxury. But on the other side, the fool, he spends whatever comes, whatever they have, whatever they get, they spend it away. So I'm not going to even look at you at this point. I'm looking down. And I'm going to ask you the question. According to this verse, are you a fool or are you wise? That's a question for you to think. 
think hard upon. If you're spending everything that you're getting, you are not living according to the wisdom of God. It's not that you, listen, listen, listen. It's not that you don't have the wisdom of God. It's simply that you're not submitting to the wisdom of God. You're not exalting wisdom. You're exalting your own desires, craving. Oh, I have to have those shoes. I have to have that dress. I have to celebrate my birthday in that hotel. And I have to invite all my friends. You understand? I have to go to vacation. And I have to go to vacation, not just in a bus, not in a train, but it has to be in a flight. Why? Because I need to take a picture from the window and upload it onto WhatsApp so that everyone will know I traveled by flight for my vacation. Now, anybody who uploaded pictures from their flights, I have no problems, okay? No problems. I've done that myself as well. No problems with that. But the intent. Why did you buy that dress? Did, did you buy it because you like it and you have more than enough to buy it? Or just to impress somebody else so that they can look at that and say, oh my goodness, wearing that brand, my God. Must be doing very well. Said who? You can buy anything you want with a credit card. Be completely in debt like an idiot. Trying to impress everybody around you. That's not wisdom. That is food. See, that's when craving. You're craving for something. And that love for that thing. That love to be seen by other people. Like you're a rich person, even though you're not. Like you have a lot of money, even though you're not having it any in the bank. Because, see, the love of money, that's the root of the evil. That's where you end up making the wrong decisions. That's when you start moving away from the faith, he said. They, the, what did Timothy say? Because of the love of money, they have wandered away from their faith. So rather than keeping God first place, because of that intense craving, that desire, that love, they've moved away from the faith. Rather than giving to the house of God, no, 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 for this month, oh, it's birthday month. So all of a sudden, house of God has to take vacation. Well, I'm not going to give to the house of God this month. Why? Because it's my birthday month. It's my anniversary month. It's our summer holidays. And the list goes on. So what is happening? You're not exalting wisdom. You exalt your own thing. And we think, oh, no, 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 pastor, I don't have love of money. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Better examine how you're making decisions. Better examine how you're spending that money. Better examine where the money is going to. See, that's where you will know. See, he says, so the fool, he spends it all away as soon as he gets it. Now, go with me to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, and starting from verse 23. He says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever. Now pay attention to this. He says, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. So what is he saying? He's saying, don't take things lightly. The wisdom of God says, pay attention. Attend to your finances. Pay attention to your finances. Do you know how much you make? Do you know how much is going out? Do you know how much is coming in? Do you know how much in debt you are currently? Is there a plan in what you have, what you don't have, how you're spending, and how you need to get to the destination that you need to get to? So in verse 23, he says, again, be diligent to know the state of your flocks. Be diligent to know the state of your finances. Be diligent in those things. Verse 25 says, when the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in. Verse 26, the lambs will provide for your clothing and the goats the price of the field. Now he's talking about being wise with finances. He says, the lambs will provide for your clothing the goats the price of the field. 
So one, he's saying, there's something coming in to spend upon yourself. But then he's saying, there's something else coming in to invest into the future. So he says, the goats will provide the price of the field. That means it's, that field is not yours, but the goats will provide the price. So buy the field. Buy the field. Don't just buy more clothes. Buy the field. Because the clothes will wear out. The field will remain. And that's how you become a good person who leaves an inheritance for their grandchildren. See, the wisdom of God is present in your lives. It's present. Under the new covenant, you have the wisdom of God. The question is, are we submitting to that wisdom? Here, Solomon is letting us know. Hey, when the money comes, discern where the money needs to go. Know the difference. You must discern what is for eating and what is for sowing. That's why in the new covenant, he says, God provides bread for the eater and seed to the sower. Which one are you? Which one are you? See, a lot of times we ask God for bread and he'll give you bread. But once the bread is eaten, you have to ask again. But if you ask God for seed, now you're onto something. Now you sow. And it keeps providing the bread. Not just for you. For the kingdom. Not just for the kingdom. For your children. Not just for your children, but your children's children. See, this is enduring wealth that he talked about. Enduring wealth and righteousness together. Not fake wealth. Not swiping the credit card to impress others kind of wealth. Real wealth. Enduring wealth. Hallelujah. Enduring wealth takes wisdom. It takes discipline. You must know and discern what is for eating, what is for sowing. You must know what is for today and what is for tomorrow. Every time you get your paycheck every month, do you understand? Do you know what is for today and do you know what is for tomorrow? Do you know what is for you and what is for the next generation? What is for you? What is for the next generation? What is for you and your wife and what is for your children? You must know what is for your house and what is for the house of God. You must know what is for your house and what is for the house of God. See, people have this misunderstanding that as money comes, you'll somehow your mind will be corrupted. Only if you let it. Only if you let it. One of the men of God that I tremendously respected, he's gone on home to be with the Lord just about a year ago. One of the things that he said was, he got so addicted to giving that every single time he would get a check, every single time he would get into a business deal or whatever, his mind will immediately calculate 40%. Why 40%? Because that's how much he would give from everything that he would receive. 40%. Started off with tithe, 10%, then he increased and increased and increased and increased. And at that point, when he was sharing this, he was at 40%. And he said, my mind is so tuned to this. Any time money is talked about, my mind is trained to calculate the 40% immediately. He says, why? Because I know exactly how much I'm going to give to the house of God. Every time a check comes in, he knows exactly how much is going directly to the house of God. And I've seen that started to happen even in my life and my wife's life. Every single time something starts up financially, every single time we're discussing something, every single time that a new opportunity comes up, immediately my mind begins to calculate. My wife begins to say, that means we can give that much. Before we can think about what we will do for ourselves, immediately the first thing is, the first thing that comes to our mind is, we're going to give that much. We're going to give that much. 
it's gotten to the point see and and okay see somebody will be hearing this and say but pastor you're the pastor so of course you will give to your church can i say this the largest seeds that me and my wife have sown have not been to this church we're getting ready to sow another very large seed and it's not to this house in fact it will be the largest one that we've ever given and it's not to this house the largest seeds that we've sown were not for our selfish oh the church needs a new whatever and so let's put some money to, no 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 not because of that it's simply the wisdom of god what is god leading and what is god directing you to and based on that you give so what goes to your house and what goes to the house of god verse 27 you shall have enough goat's milk for your food for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maid servants in other words he's saying when you do these things you will have more than enough to take care of everything you'll have more than enough to take care of everything amen now three quick things what do we do with what we have heard i have three suggestions for you number 1 get wisdom and get rid of misconceptions regarding wealth and riches get wisdom and get rid of misconceptions number 2 pay attention and attend to your finances for some of you the most spiritual thing that you can do today is once you go home take a look at your accounts pay attention to it and attend to it see where your money is where it needs to be added what needs to be taken care of pay attention and attend to your finances and number 3 here's a formula If you want enduring riches sowing in the kingdom of God plus good investments equals enduring riches sowing in the kingdom of God plus good investments equals enduring riches So how are you doing in both those categories When it comes to sowing into the kingdom of God where are you When it comes to making good investments where are you See if you can answer these questions if you can put these things together there's no question that I mean there's no reason why any Christian should be in lack No reason whatsoever In fact, you do these two things, the, the, just sowing into the kingdom and make good investments for which you need the wisdom of God. For which you need the wisdom of God. You will have enduring riches in your life. And through you, just as God told Abraham, through you all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Through you, the kingdom of God's going to expand. through you lives will be changed through you families will be built through you people will be healed through you people will be educated through you people will be restored it's going to happen through you amen the wealth of the wicked is looking for you has been laid up for you if you can believe that if you can receive that if you can walk in the wisdom of god there is no reason why any person needs to live in poverty or lack in your life amen let's pray father we thank you for speaking to us today we thank you for your word we thank you for all that you've done not only have you forgiven our sins not only have you made us righteous Not only have you taken sickness and disease from us and healed us but you became poor for us so that you through your poverty might make us rich and today we receive that lord by faith and i thank you lord that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for us the righteous 
and I command that wealth to find its way into those that are in this place and those that are joining us online. May they receive it with faith and let supernatural signs, wonders and miracles break forth in the lives of your people as a result of this word. Supernatural increase in riches and wealth and honor in the lives of your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give a clap offering unto the Lord this morning. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that the Word of God has been a blessing to you. Now, no matter where you're joining us from, if you are ever in the Hyderabad area, I would invite you and I would love to see you at New City Church at one of our services. If you live anywhere in or around Hyderabad and Secunderabad, why don't you make plans to come and join us at New City Church? You'll, you'll experience the presence of God, you will hear the Word of God, and you will be able to receive the things that God has destined for your life. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we would love to see you here at New City Church. God bless.